To start off the stream, we're going to be talking all about classic games, and specifically what I like to call the next step games. Now, a couple of disclaimers here with this. This is obviously going to focus on games that are that have a similar feel to some of your classic games, some of the, the, the very basic games. And I had actually reached out to people on social media as far as what classic game, what people consider as a classic game. And I, I all the responses, I there were a bunch of responses. Thank you very much for all of that. But I compiled and I was originally going to choose the top 10, but because we had a little bit of a tie uh, towards the end, we were adding one. So it's a top 10 plus one or top 11. Uh, and so, yeah, we're going to be taking a look at all of these these classic games and, and taking a look at some games that are adjacent. The reason why I want to bring, do that is I think, you know, you have all these classic games that everybody knows, but there's still a large majority of, uh, of people who may not know much past that and that their experience of board game is at that point. And these, not saying that any of these classic games are bad or, or you know, it's wrong to like them. Everyone can have their own taste and everything, but I figured, you know, for those who maybe like a certain game and want to kind of dive deeper and in, into something in a similar style, or for those who maybe they they are they kind of like the theme, but there's one thing that's off, and it's like I, if there only that one thing wasn't there, then maybe I'd like it. Or or maybe you just there's some parts aspects that you just absolutely hate and you will not play. But if it was dealt with in a different manner, then you'd get into it. So th I wanted to present this list as a way of. Uh, introducing some newer people into the hobby and, and uh, uh, as a way of saying, hey, if you like these games or, or if you're in one of those situations, these are, are good alternatives or, or good next step. And that's kind of why I had come up with this idea of next step games. So we're going to be going through these 11 games, uh, starting from the, the one that was voted on the least with, uh, with that public poll, the public uh, question there, all the way up until uh, the the number one request and answer and I'll, I'll give my personal opinions but before we get into today a couple small little details first off you might be seeing this and uh, noticing that I finally made twitch affiliate uh, we are which is extremely exciting I, I'm very glad to be able to have hit this milestone here uh, what that means here is that obviously you know now if you are joining you're tuning in you can now subscribe. You can. Uh, I'll. I'll start ha uh, to kind of come up with some emotes and, and things like that. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, getting me to that place and and helping me to to hit this goal. It's a, a huge milestone, and I'm very proud of uh, both myself and and uh, yeah of everyone that's been involved as a part of it. Uh, yeah, thank you guys as well for for journeying alongside and getting me to that place. Last disclaimer, I should say, a good amount of these I have played. There are some on the list just because I tried to do two games per classic. Uh, there are some on the list that I have not necessarily played, but I know a good amount of that I'm confident that I can talk about that in that setting. However, you know, you can take that with a grain of salt as well. So getting started with the number 11 uh, option here, we have Clue. Now. Clue uh, with this, this is a murder mystery, obviously you're going around, uh, it's a deduction type of game, uh, trying to find out who had murdered Professor X or Mr. X or whoever it was, um, uh, and with what and in what room. So uh, an idea you're trying to deduce the, the murder mystery. And so here, as an honorable mention, I think most social deduction games have a little bit of, of that idea, obviously with the, the deduction being the big part of it. But the two that I picked for this one, are the Quest for Planet X and Deception Murder in Hong Kong. Now, Quest for Planet X is a straight up deduction game. There's no murder mystery element in it, but uh, what what's here is uh, it uses this app that randomly generates an arrangement of objects and a location for Planet X. And so your research is trying to find this planet amongst all of the other objects that are out on the board. Uh, and and it follows, the, the location of Planet X is gonna follow logical rules that are all predefined. And so as you are traveling, you're gonna be performing different actions that give you an idea of the objects that are on the board and where Planet X might be in relation to certain objects. And so you'll write these down in your private notepad until you believe where you know Planet X is, and then you conduct a search and hopefully successfully find it. 
And so this is very similar in that clue aspect where you're trying to discover clues and, and figure out that logic puzzle, uh, uh, kind of writing it down on your notepad and your private you know, sheet here, your scorecard, and then you're going out and finding Planet X with that. And so it has a very, very similar feel to that clue aspect where you're just discovering more information, writing it down, and then making that final guess to hope that you, you get that right. Uh, on the flip side, if you are someone who likes that murder mystery aspect, Deception Murder in Hong Kong is, uh, it plays like a murder mystery with each person as the investigator, only one person is the murderer. And there are some other unique roles that are assigned. You have the murderer, you have the accomplice, you have the witness and the forensic scientist, which is a huge one in the game. Uh, and each role represents one side or the other. And of course you have all the, the investigators as well. Uh, the true investigators want to figure out what really happened with the murder while the, the, the murder and the accomplice want to mislead and deceive the, the group uh, to, to try and get away with uh, the crime here. And so the forensic scientists, I mentioned it before, they hold the solution to the crime, but you can only communicate using scene tiles. And so everyone else is deducing by those tiles as to what happened in the scene of the crime uh, and who did it, the key evidence and as the, the means as to why they did it. Um, and, and so this is a uh, that murder mystery played out uh, with a couple extra hidden roles, a little bit more agency in that fact. Uh, I could have gone with a lot of social deduction games, including some that I have played more of, but this one is uh, a fantastic uh, and highly recommended social deduction game being Deception Murder in Hong Kong. And so those are the two that I would give to Clue, mostly based off of their uh, deduction elements in this. All right, moving from Clue, we are on to Risk. So Risk obviously being this big war game that's kind of spawned the whole dudes on a map type of thing. Uh, and so you're playing as armies trying to, trying to uh, accomplish a, a conquest of the world here. And so with Risk, honorable mention would be most games like that. There's a lot of games that have that idea of armies and warriors on a map trying to control territories and whatnot. But the two that I chose here are Small World and then I kind of kind of made a slight thing, Blitzkrieg slash Caesar. They're, they're very similar games, but uh, uh, they play out a little bit differently. And so, so with Small World, you play as different fantasy races with a special ability, choosing them through this drafting system. You're gonna have a list of different races and their abilities, you draft them, and then you're going to be deploying the warriors to cover as much ground as possible, trying to take control of as much of that territory as you can. And so the more areas that you control, the more points that you get. The combat is incredibly simple based just on how many warriors you have as opposed to uh, how many pieces are on the board. And so at various points, the, this one deviates a little bit from risk. Uh, you, you will have to go into what's known as decline where essentially you've done all that you can with one race. You're going to kind of deactivate it and then you can pick another one to expand as far, uh, as far out as you can with the newer race on the board. Uh, and so it, it, it plays off of that idea that you are expanding and it's still very simple and, and uh, easy to, to play. Uh, and it also doesn't have the long run time that Risk can sometimes run into. And so that's gonna be small right there. However, if you do like the specifically a, a more, like a, a slightly more realistic setting, like in the world, Blitzkrieg is a fantastic game to try out at the very least. And the sequel to this, Caesar, is also, uh, it plays very similarly. Uh, in that camp as well. Uh, with Blitzkrieg and Caesar, uh, it, it's that idea of this World War II or seizing Rome in 20 minutes. You can play this in a very short amount of time. And so what you're doing is you're gonna be drawing from a bag to determine the forces uh, and the armies that you're able to use. And you're going to be deploying them into areas, playing this tug of war style of game and using tactical positioning to vie for control over the different territories or theaters. And, and controlling some theaters might give you an advantage in some other place as well. I, I, admittedly, this Blitzkrieg and Caesar, I have not played yet. I've done, I've looked a lot at the gameplay. I want to try it out. Uh, but I would say that this is a, another good sidestep from Risk. In Small World, I have played it. it does give that risk feel. So that's the reason why I would say these two would uh, would be good next step games in regards to that. The next one on the list here is Sorry. Now Sorry, obviously you're moving these tokens. It's almost like a, a race type of game where you're trying to move these pawns 
all the way to the end as fast as you are able to. Uh, you're gonna be playing these different cards as moving, and the, one of the big parts of this is being able to knock other people's places, sending them right back to the start. And, and so I picked a couple of very simple games that, that kind of plays off these aspects in a little bit. It, 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 this one was uh, one I had a little bit of a tough time starting off with, but I think these two games are, are um, you know, they're, they're decent next steps into, yeah, into the hobby here. And that would be Suro and Flam Rouge. I'll start with Suro being the one that I played a lot more. Uh, this here, you're placing tiles with different path layouts, and you're just following the path with the goal of staying on the board. However, it gets harder to plan that out as more tiles are being laid out. The board kind of closes in and, and the, or, or rather there's, there's fewer spaces to place the tiles and you have to think a little bit more of, okay, if I'm placing this tile here, if I follow this path, okay, I'm still safe and I'm on the board right there. And you kind of, there's, there's a bit of a thinkiness to it. Uh, but what makes it like sorry is its simplicity, uh, but more so in the way that you can, you can play a certain way where you can impact other players. And with the placement of one tile, you can dictate where uh, others move. You can potentially knock them off the board into another person or just simply forcing them into a position that is worse for them. And so it kind of gives you that sorry feel where it's like, I'm gonna place this right here and send you in a much worse position or send you out of the game. Uh, and so that's why I put Zero on this list. The second one, and this one I, I again, this is one I have not played yet, uh, but Flamme Rouge, this is a racing game where you have two racers, a, a ruler and a sprinter, and you are drawing and playing these cards to determine how they move. So again, that card, you know, being able to move via these different cards that you were playing from your hand, but you have to manage exhaustion as well. And so you're gonna be using slip streams from yourself and from other racers to help with, with, ex with that exhaustion and to position yourself so that you can finish in the race first. Uh, similar that you can move with the cards and that your actions also d impact your opponents directly or you can even utilize your opponents actions to impact yourself trying to ride their slipstreams as they you know they're trying to get away from the pack maybe take an early lead or maybe someone will try and hold back and, and like make a big burst at the end uh, but all of your actions will dictate how the other opponents will act as well you can cut people off uh, this is a fantastic game from what I have seen uh, another game that's on my two playlist but uh, that is the reason for these two picks here that's going to be the number nine here sorry number eight is Scrabble now of course this is a, a word game where you're placing down these these tiles these letter tiles in uh, to make a word and as you're doing so you're gonna be scoring for these words also placing them on a board that can give you uh, extra you know extra scoring potential with the uh, double letters triple words all these different things and so that positioning and that you know coming up with words are kind of the two big keys to it and so for that reason I chose two games that kind of one plays off one aspect one plays off of the other for this one so here I chose paperback for kind of if you like that that idea of creating words with uh, cards or tiles that you have in your hand and Quirkle for the placement aspect here. So an honorable mention for the paperback one is another uh, word one you can think of is letter jam. That idea if you like words and working together, it could be a good pick as well. But for paperback specifically, you have a basic deck of letter cards and wild cards. And each round, you're gonna be using this using cards in your hand to create a word. You just lay, lay them down, create a word, and it will score you a certain amount of points that you can use to buy more cards, uh, buy more letter cards specifically. Uh, which, you know, once you buy those letter cards, they get put into your deck. It's a deck building game, so it kind of builds up as you go through it. Uh, and some of those letters even have special abilities like a double letter score or allowing you to draw more cards. Uh, and, and so if you like those extra spaces that are a normal Scrabble board, this helps spice up the game as well. Uh, and so the goal is to buy certain cards to get victory points as well. So this is a great idea for those who like the word crafting idea or, or but wants it a little bit shorter or looking for a different spin on, on some of that there. Now Quirkle, I had almost put Azul on here as well because it has a little bit of tile placement, but I think this one does a bit more with uh, specifically that S Scrabble style placement here. Quirkle, uh, if you like that tile placing aspect of Scrabble and the scoring of the points, but not so much the words, this would be a great alternative. Here you have a set of tiles that, uh, that with different shapes and colors. Uh, and so you can, one at a time, you can place any amount of either the same color 
or the same symbol tiles that you like in a row or column here. However, you must connect it with one other tile previously laid and you can't have two of the exact same shape or exact same tile with the same shape and color in a connecting row or column. And so with this, uh, it, it plays out very similarly to Scrabble where as you're placing down these tiles, it allows you to score numerous different points here. Uh, and the points grow only exponentially as you can connect them, as you can kind of bring them together. Uh, and so that's going to be the note for uh, Quirkle here, how it relates to Scrabble here. Uh, paperback and Quirkle, two great games that kind of imitate Scrabble in two different ways. And so you can kind of play off of that how you would like. My number seven is going to be talking about the game of life. So the game of life, obviously, you're, you're, you know, have this little car on the board. I used to play this all the time with my brothers where we would uh, we would play this game and like just see what happens in life and just have fun uh, just kind of exploring. I think that's one of the big, big draws to this game. You're just mindlessly spinning the spinner, which is very satisfying to to accomplish as well. But um, you're spinning that spinner and then you're just going through life and seeing what happens. Uh, there's not a, really a whole lot of strategy in it, but it can be uh, uh, a lot of fun, just kind of almost role playing in a sense. Uh, and so the two games I've chosen here are Tokaido and Pursuit of Happiness. So in Tokaido, uh, rather than a, a game spanning your entire life, you are just traveling across the EC road in Japan. You're on like a vacation or on a trip, uh, and your goal is essentially to make the most of your trip, engaging in the culture through various means. You're purchasing souvenirs, eating meals, visiting temples, meeting people, uh, visiting wild places. And whoever is the most initiated traveler, whoever has explored the most and, and really made the most out of their trip, they win the game at the end. And so it plays somewhat similar to the game of life as well. Uh, you may not be spinning, but you're, you're moving along this one track and, and and you cannot move backwards. So you're, you're going forwards at a constant pace there. Instead of rolling to determine movement, it's simply whoever is the furthest back can move as far forward as they would like or are able to. And so you're, you're managing how far forward you wanna move while also managing the money that you have with you. Uh, and, and so taking that time and just like seeing, okay, how much can I experience with the resources, with, the, with what I have, uh, that's a huge part of the game. However, if you are someone who really likes that aspect of living your life, uh, you know, spanning your lifetime, the pursuit of happiness is right up your alley. This is this is like the perfect fit for life or like the game of life and, and kind of like that next step of like with the pursuit of happiness rather than having just one track that you follow, you spin the spitter, let it happen here. You take on a character spanning the lifetime and you get to actually make the decisions on how you want to live your life the, the way that you always wanted. You can move your workers here to kind of uh, exemplify the, the time that you spent on getting jobs, working on projects, going through schooling, engaging relationships, starting a family, you know, all these different things that you could do. And so this is a lot more open-ended and gives you more options. Uh, it almost plays more to like a board game version of The Sims in some ways where you can like uh, uh, choose. It really is very open-ended as to how you want to live your life there. And so uh, this is a, a like natural fit nestles right up to that game of life uh, uh, idea. And so that's going to be the pursuit of happiness, my number seven, or for the game of life, that'll be the set, seventh game out of 11 here. The next one we have here is one we're actually gonna be playing later on today here. Uh, and that is Catan or Catan. I, I've always been mixed up about how to pronounce this thing. Uh, but with this one, uh, and I chose two, two uh, very different ones here. I, I chose uh, Terraforming Mars and Bonanza. Uh, I'll start with Bonanza here. If you love the trading aspect specifically, if you're someone who enjoys that idea that you're interacting with people and you're trading these cards, trying to get the best deal, this is something you might enjoy where, where you're trying to collect these beans to put in your field and to harvest as big of a crop as you're able to, to make the most money. And you're, so you're doing these by planting beans from your hand and then trading beans between some of the other players over various rounds. And so if you like that training aspect, you can kind of, uh, you might enjoy that idea of, okay, I have a bean 
that I want to trade so that I, uh, I can get another bean in my field, but maybe this bean, because it's a more rarer bean, I might want to try and get a better deal. Uh, or, or I might want to play off the fact that, well, if they don't trade that bean, they, they're going to be stuck with planning it, so I can leverage that to my advantage when I'm making my trades. And so uh, if you like that trading aspect of Catan and you want to kind of explore, this is a really great way to do it. Uh, however, if you are if you like that idea of settling down on Catan and you just want to ramp it up a little bit more, make have a bit more of a complex game, uh, I, I hesitated for a little bit, but I think Terraforming Mars would be a really good option for you here. This is definitely a more complex version of Catan that plays quite a bit longer. It's, I, I remember the, when I played it, uh, the last time I played it was like three hours long. Um, still very engaging. I, I was engaged the entire time, but it's definitely a little bit different than Catan, which will take about like an hour or so. Uh, rather than settling on an island, you're a corporation preparing Mars to be settled and to be inhabited. As you, uh, you're playing certain cards and you're placing terrain on the board to give yourself as many victory points as possible. And so you're gonna be undertaking many projects that represent a variety of things, whether that's plant, plant or animal life, maybe that's building cities or, or, or building certain things that are on Mars there, mining moons. There's so many different things that you can do with this game. There are, there are a load of cards. They're almost to the point where you can get information overload, uh, but all of which can give you either immediate bonuses or bonuses toward the end game. And so while, while it's a lot more complicated, the theme is somewhat similar where you're trying to inhabit this area and it also deals with resource management and trying to be the, the leading industry in various areas. You know, you have Catan with, you know, having the largest army or, or the longest road. Here, there there's rewards for being a, a, a leader in an industry in a certain areas as well. And so it kind of plays a little bit off that, but just makes it much more complicated. It, it expands much, uh, or rather I should say, it, it expands the scope of what you can do uh, with a game like that a lot more. So that's the options that I have here for Catan specifically. All right, five more games here. The fifth last game here, you know, we're starting to get into some that were very often, you know, when I brought this up in the poll, these were starting to get uh, uh, more frequently requested here. This next one is Cribbage. Now, this one was a tough one because I love Cribbage as well. I think there's not a whole lot of games that uh, um, do what Cribbage does in a, in a satisfying way. I did find two games that are very similar to it. Uh, and so like it's this could be more of a sidestep is like Yeah, you this you might be interested in something like this But I this was definitely one of the harder ones for myself to uh, pick through as well uh, And so for the two I chose I chose point salad and sushi go party here so with point salad both of these games, they're both smaller games where you're uh, accumulating points in different ways and your decisions affect other players. And so with the with points out specifically, you have different ways of scoring. You're trying to draft from a pool of uh, vegetables in front of you uh, to create a salad that works with the ways that you score. And it's going to look different every single game. Uh, and so with Sushi Go, rather than drafting them from the center where everyone can see it, you're gonna be having a hand of cards here. You'd pick a card, you put it down, you're, and you pass the cards on to the to the rest of the uh, table, to the next person. Almost as though the conveyor belt is going along, you're grabbing your card, you're putting it down. And so both are very simple. The reason I chose these ones is because obviously with um, Cribbage, there's a little bit of a drafting process in there and choosing which cards you want to keep and which ones you want to uh, uh, put in the crib or, or either yours or opponents. Uh, and then obviously there's a lot of points that are being scored. It allows you to potentially have multiple combos and, and to score in, in dynamic ways. And so that's the reason why I chose these ones. Uh, both are fairly simple. There's a good amount of depth in there as well. Both are card games that focus on scoring points through different means. Uh, and both have something to do with that drafting element for the best conversation here. So that's going to be uh, the number five there, Cribbage. Number four is a classic. I play this a lot with, with family as well. Uh, and this is Yahtzee. And so this is, uh, as a, an honorable mention, this spawned an entire genre of roll and writes. Essentially you roll, see what happens, you choose things and you write down what you want at, based off that roll what you want to get out of it. And so the two that I chose here, there's a lot that you could have chosen from, uh, but I chose these two for various reasons. Uh, King of Tokyo 
and twice as clever or Dot Belt so clever. I probably whooped the uh, or whiffed the uh, pronunciation on that. Uh, but with King of Tokyo, if you enjoy that Yahtzee mechanic of re-rolling three times, uh, but you want to add a theme and some special powers in, in, into it as well, this is a great recommendation from myself. You still have that rule of the, you know, rolling the dice three times and choosing which to keep and then re-rolling uh, uh, for each time. However, you play as one of these monsters who is going through Tokyo, uh, trying to gain the most victory points, kind of symbolizing the fame. And they're also trying, or the other way you can win is by destroying other monsters. And so when you roll the dice, you can use the dice to gain some of those victory points. You can use them to attack other monsters, to heal. And then you can also use them to gain special powers that you can utilize. Some will play off of the dice. Some will give you extra abilities, like an extra dice that you can play or an extra reroll. Uh, and so this is a very neat uh, uh, game that plays off that Yahtzee, but then uh, builds off of it as well, adding a little bit of a, uh, a nice theme to it as well. Uh, and so if you're someone who wants to look for more themes specifically, this is a great alternative for that. However, if you like that, that idea of a, just a basic roll and write, a little bit more abstracted, uh, but you want a little bit more, uh, uh, a well, you, you want it a little bit more complex and to, to make it a little bit more clever as to how you write things down, how you choose the dice and activate them. Uh, my favorite roll and write so far is twice as clever here. And so it takes some of those basics from Yahtzee, that idea that you're re-rolling the dice a couple of times, but it makes it slightly more complicated, uh, but still thinking nonetheless. You're going to be rolling these different colored dice with each of the colors scoring differently when you activate them. And then you choose one of the dice that you would like to activate on, to write down on the board here. And to spice things up, if you meet certain requirements in, you know, let's say if you're activating the blue dice, you know, you as you're moving up the track, you might hit certain requirements where you fill a, a spot in your board, in your scorecard, and it will activate, it'll activate you to be able to write down something in a different area. And so there's a little bit of playing around with, uh, with combos and everything. And while the goal is, with that goal of getting the highest score possible throughout filling out your scorecard the best that you can. There's a lot of other rules involved. It's a lot more complicated than what I, than just what I had said, but that's kind of a basic brief idea as to what is happening. So if you want to go and check out uh, the, the, some alternative to Yossi, something a little bit more, uh, you know, taking that next step again into making it more complex and thinky, that'd be a great alternative there. The third one, very, very popular, very, very uh, uh, known around the world. This is chess, obviously, here. With chess, obviously, you're, you're taking your, your little armies and uh, it, it's what's known as an abstract strategy game. So there's not really any major theme uh, to it, but you're, you're, you're wanting to utilize your positioning in such a way so that you can take your opponent's king and, and put them into what's known as checkmate. Uh, and so with this, I kind of took that idea of that abstract strategy and, and uh, looked at various different aspects of it. Uh, and I came up with these two here. We have Onitama and War Chest. Onitama I've talked plenty of times about, but this, uh, the, the presentation of Onitama actually looks like a miniature version of chess already. So the board is just a five by five board and you have the equivalent of one king and four pawns. However, rather than each of those, those pieces having predetermined movement, you, the movement is determined by cards that you have in your hand. When you play a card, you move the piece according to what that card says. Uh, and then you give it to your opponent to use on the next turn. So again, it's that little back and forth. It's like, okay, I'm gonna use this to put myself into this tactical position, but I need to be careful because I'm giving my opponent that card and they can use that uh, uh, in the future. And so you have to be aware of all of the different variables in, in that as well. And so again, I've talked about it many times. You can probably find uh, other videos uh, on the channel there uh, of me talking about it, but the other one that I want to highlight is War Chest. And so if you like the idea, rather of having movement determined by cards, but uh, of having each piece with their own predetermined movement, this one could be a better alternative for yourself. You start the game by drafting certain warrior types into an army. So you might have cavalry or light cavalry, which can move further, or uh, archers, crossbowmen, you know, uh, a different variety of, of warriors here. And you're going to be putting certain chips into a bag and on your turn you're going to be drawing some of these chips and you're using them to deploy your warriors to bolster them make them stronger to move and to attack and each warrior 
has special abilities that you can utilize uh, to help your positioning on the board. And the goal is just simply to take control of certain key points that are on the battlefield rather than taking out your opponent's pieces. It might be a, a huge part of it, but the, the main thing is, is you wanna position yourself in a way that you can have control over certain spaces. And so that tactical nature is at play here as well. Uh, and, and so both of these games are, are really great alternatives to chess if you're looking for even just something to, to switch things up here. Uh, those are going to be Onitama and War Chess here. War Chest. The last two, these are very similar games here. Uh, the, this next one was, I actually didn't anticipate this to be getting as much, uh, uh, as much votes as it did when I did the poll here. This is Payday where you're, you're going along, you're, you're rolling the dice to go along this calendar, and it, it plays a little bit similar to life in that you're just kind of letting things happen, and you're, you know, there's small decisions that you can make, but for the most part, you're just kind of letting things go and watching as you know, you're receiving money through various means, specifically through your job and the pay that you have, and then you're also gonna be spending it to pay bills and invest in things. It, it plays similar to life. Some of the things you might recommend with life is uh, it, it can play out here as well, but I wanted to focus a little bit more on that financial aspect here. Uh, and so for that, and this was admittedly very hard for me to kind of figure out here, but I had chosen the networks and acquire. So with the networks, uh, this one I have not uh, necessarily played, but again, I've done a lot of research on this one. You and your opponents are different television networks and you're competing for different shows, different stars, and different ads to get as much viewers and profit as possible. Uh, and so here, I chose this one because with Payday, you know, you're dealing with everyday things going on and trying to manage money. And here it's, it's similar, except, you know, that idea of managing Managing something we encounter with everyday life, you know, TV is, is a huge part for most people here. But you almost get to play the other side and you try to figure out what's the best way to earn money through the world of television, through and, and kind of managing, managing trying to pick up these shows and these actors, these stars, and, and trying to, you know, get that influx of cash there to, to be one of the better networks that is on, you know, on the scene of television. Now, the, the other game, Acquire, I, this plays like a stock market game, which sounds extremely complex, and many stock market games are, but this is a much simpler version than it sounds. Uh, I almost chose Stockpile, which is another stock, stock market game, which could work again, that idea of money coming in and out. Uh, but you're watching these companies grow on the board with Acquire, and you're choosing whether you want to buy or sell stock, Very just put very simply here. Uh, and so if you like that, specifically that back and forth with money of, of being able to gain money through different means and then using that to spend as well, uh, this could be a really cool connection to Payday in that sense. So a little bit more abstracted or, or a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, trying to stretch to, to make this work. But for Payday, I chose the networks and acquire here. Very last one, my number one uh, game that I got the most votes. It's no surprise that it's Monopoly. This was also one that was a little bit tougher for myself to think about, mostly because if if someone were to come up to me and say, hey, I like Monopoly, but I'm like looking for something that's shorter that gives me that same feel, I would mostly say just play Monopoly deal. It's, a, it's that exact same feeling as Monopoly, a little bit more chaotic, but ideally you're collecting, the, you're, you're, you're set collecting, getting these different properties and, and then using them to force your opponents to pay money. Uh, it, it's it's Monopoly literally squeezed into a 15 minute game and then ramped up to give you the best Monopoly feel. I This is my favorite version of Monopoly, obviously. But if you're looking for something even more different or, or something that kind of plays off of that, the two that I have here are For Sale and Machi Koro. Uh, for Sale, it, it's a little bit, it's. Both of these are, are fairly uh, more tame. For Sale is definitely the, the most tame, I would say, of these two here. Here, you're simply just acquiring buildings in that first round. You're gonna be buying different properties. Uh, and then you're in the second round, you're gonna be selling off those properties and making the most money. And so if you're that type of person who loves that idea of, of buying properties or, or buying buying and owning something and then selling them to, to make a profit or, or trying to gain as much of a, uh, gain as much value as you can out of what you have with the, 
with the properties and everything, this might be something that would interest you as well. However, I would say a lot, uh, something that's a lot more similar to Monopoly would be Machi Koro. Here you're building up your city with different cards, and then when you roll the dice, if they match up with the cards you have, you get even more money that you can spend on cards. And so even, even some of those, uh, they have some abilities such as letting you take money from others, almost like a card game of Monopoly or like a mix of Monopoly and Catan in some ways as well. Uh, but I would say this is a, a, a good fit for the game here. That is Machi Koro and for sale to, uh, to kind of talk about Monopoly. And so that is the, the list of what I would consider to be the next step games in, in, uh, for all of these classic games. And of course, feel free to disagree with me. You can kind of state it in the comments here in Twitch or on YouTube. Uh, I would love to hear your opinions on, on the games that I chose or on what you would recommend to those who are kind of getting into the hobby or kind of exploring uh, and, and kind of um, expanding on these classic games specifically. I would love to hear more from you on that.